Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for watching, I should say. This is a presentation about Lacan. Here's Lacan, famous psychoanalyst of the 20th century, and Zizek. He is the, probably the most famous philosopher alive right now, but um, he is also the world's leading scholar of Lacanian psychoanalytics. Um, he has a PhD in uh, Lacanian psychoanalytics, and he has written about 60 books on Lacan. And um, most of his ideas is a basically applying Lacan to understand narrative, to understand society, to understand literature. And so that's why we're talking about him in this class. Um, we're using their insights to interpret narrative and interpret stories. So these are some of the Lacan Zizek main ideas. Of course, they're from Lacan, but he's a, Zizek is applying them in new situations. Imaginary, symbolic, real, mirror stage, phallus, petit objet a, neurosis, perversion, hysteria, and the act and the master signifier. All right, so um, let's talk about the imaginary and the symbolic. Um, so the imaginary, this is what the, we're gonna talk about in the journey to the symbolic. We talked about Peter Pan before. He basically imagined his own world um, irrespective of the rules of society. So for example, Peter Pan can fly, um, you know, he can imagine different kinds of foods. He can fight with um, pirates and, you know, alligators and things like this. So he's in his own imaginary world and um, he makes the rules in that place. It's not based on society's rules. We're going to talk about the mirror stage. Um, this is a stage in baby's developments. Um, basically, this is at the stage when the baby can recognize itself as an individual in a mirror, and it distinguishes itself from its mom or its dad. Um, so before the mirror stage, the baby might just see a hand, you know, might hear a voice and not really recognize itself as a being or as a whole um, person. But the mirror stage is whenever the baby recognizes itself in a mirror as a whole self. It recognizes its mom is not part of the baby, it recognizes the dad is not part of the baby. And, um, but the reason why this is important is because the baby has not learned language yet. So the baby is not in the symbolic realm. The baby is in the imaginary realm during the mirror stage. So basically the baby has probably two or three years um, as it recognizes itself as an individual separate from its mother. And it is creating a story without language, just from its imagination only about its mom, about its dad and about itself. And it, that is the first story that the baby has and that includes like intense emotions of its of being separated from its mom and its dad. And um, that's what the mirror stage is. It's basically like the, the first story of the baby without language, without the rules of society. And it's just in the imagination only. The name of the father slash castration. This is the process of the baby being learning the rules of society, right? The baby is, um, must be taught, you know, how to um, go to the bathroom. The baby must be taught words. And this process of learning the rules of society, maybe going to school, this is going from the imaginary, from the mirror stage to the symbolic, where it is uh, learning the rules of society and language and so forth. Um, the phallus, this is a very important part of Lacan. So basically, um, this is what distracts the, the mother who's the primary caretaker of the child, right? Um, the, the child has this deep connection with the mom, but the mom might start using her cell phone and start getting satisfaction not from the child. And that um, source of satisfaction, which is not the child, is called the phallus. And we'll talk about that more later. The objet petit a is, so if we just have an object, so for example, this, um, this remote control, 
it's just a remote control. But whenever I look at it, whenever I look at it from my subjective perspective, it's not, it's not just a normal remote control because whenever I look at it, I see it through my fears and my desires, things like this. And so um, there might, you know, maybe this remote control is something that I always wanted. Maybe I always wanted a projector. And if I had a projector, which is, this is like a remote for a projector, then I would be like, wow, maybe I'll have power. Maybe I'll be the source of satisfaction um, that people will love me if I have this. So based on my, through, the, through my crooked glasses, if you remember, I, I used the crooked glasses before. Um, seeing this through my, my broken self, my crooked glasses, that's the petit object, um, the object through the, the subjective perspective. So just remember petit object is the crooked glasses, me seeing the world, seeing the thing through my fears and desires and my um, trauma. Imaginary order. So like we talked about this, right? The explanation of reality, it's not based on science. It's not based on any common rules that we have. It's only from yourself. So the imaginary realm of like the baby, um, it's just making up, understanding the world only from its own knowledge, like Peter Pan also, he's just creating it from himself. But the imaginary order, the imaginary realm, this, is, this helps us explore, build and grow. So it actually has benefits if we are you know, using our imagination to solve problems or to think about things, it helps us build ourselves and grow. Um, the imaginary order, it's organized around immediate feelings, like how you feel at the time. And it's also based on our creative drive. So the imaginary order again, babies create their own idea of the world before language, right? That's when they're in the mirror stage, they're understanding the world. They're, they are saying, okay, this is what the world is about. It's from themselves. Doctors imagine how to treat patients. So they're wondering, I wonder if this would work. I wonder if this would work. They're kind of imagining in their mind um, solutions to the problems. Peter Pan, projecting his own imaginary world, lives in a fantasy. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. So here's Peter Pan. In his world, in his imaginary world that he created, it's from himself, right? He can fly in this world. Um, he is in charge, right? Because he created the rules, since it's his imaginary rules, it's not based on the rules of society. If you're going to interact with him, you need to follow his rules. So, right, so these kids, they can fly, they can go to Never Never Land, which is his imaginary world. So um, Peter in the imaginary world, rules are made up. They're not from science, not from society. Followers must live in a created fantasy, right? So if they're going to follow him, they, you know, they can't, like the rules of society don't really apply. They just have to listen to Peter and rely on him. Denying Peter means leaving the fantasy. So if you say, no, Peter, that's not, that's not based on science. If you say that, you can't be in his world anymore because his world is from him. So what if Peter is wrong? What if Peter suddenly can't fly or something like that? Or, you know, what if he tries to fly, but he can't? He won't understand his own mistakes um, because he is the source in his imaginary world. He'll become frustrated. He'll just make excuses and say, oh, maybe I didn't have enough fairy dust, right? He says, if he has fairy dust and he thinks of a good thought, he can fly, that's his rules. But that's obviously not true in our world. Um, so he would just make excuse if he'd say, ah, I got the wrong fairy dust, right? So um, he would create a new fantasy or a new explanation to make up for reasons that he's wrong. So his fantasy is going this way, oh, it doesn't work, so I'll just make a new fantasy and go this way. That's what confabulation is. It's just like, you know, you're not listening to the reality, you're just based on your own um, fantasy. All right, so what if there are two leaders of the imaginary are in conflict. So if there's two Peter Pans meet each other, what's gonna happen? The conflict will just build and build until they kill each other. I think another example of this would be like Battle Royale, uh, whenever 
um, you know, kids, they're not, maybe they don't have enough knowledge about science or about taking care of themselves. They just are imagining what, you know, they're in the imaginary realm. So they basically just fight each other, kill each other because they're not, um, their fantasies are just hitting each other and they can't coexist well. So we talked a little bit about the mirror stage. Um, no longer sees itself. This is when the baby no longer sees itself as fragmented. Maybe when the baby is first born, it's just like, oh, there's a hand. I don't know what that hand is. It's probably not my hand, but whoa, what is that? Or a cry, ah, where did the cry come from? At the very beginning of the baby's development, um, it doesn't really see itself as a whole being. But there is a point where it recognizes itself as a unified image. It sees itself in the mirror and says, oh, that hand was me. Oh, that voice is my voice. It starts to recognize itself. And it recognizes itself different from others, like its mom or its dad. And it, imagine, it imagines itself as great. So part of the mirror stage is like, oh man, the world is around me because it's in the imaginary realm. The, the rules, it's not based on society's rules. It's based on its imagination. <clears throat> so another part of the mirror stage is, of course, mommy loves me. I'm great, right? The baby thinks it's amazing. And of course, the mommy loves me. Mom makes me feel happy too. So there's like this connection. And of course, that could be a dad too. Could show lots of love to the child and be the primary caretaker too. But um, this is an important part of the mirror stage. The, the mom is a big source of love and comfort. Oh my gosh. But what happens whenever mommy is distracted? Daddy has something that I don't have, right? Maybe the mom is enjoying a basketball game with her husband and the baby's like, oh no, why are they watching basketball? I want, I want her to watch me. Maybe they're watching some cool TV show, but I thought that mom loved me. And so the baby sees the mom having satisfaction, not from the baby. And so that makes the baby feel lonely or sad, maybe confused because the baby thought, I'm great, right? Maybe mommy is distracted because of YouTube. Maybe she's watching her cell phone. Why does mommy love YouTube more than me? I know, I will become a YouTuber, then mommy will love me, right? The baby will start to think, well, I want that love again, right? So what should I do? Maybe I should become a YouTuber. YouTube is the source of satisfaction other than the baby. This is called the phallus, source of satisfaction other than the baby. The baby becomes fascinated by YouTube and will work hard to learn about YouTube. It will try to um, understand the hobbies of the mom and maybe that will be the key to being loved and accepted. So mommy is distracted. Uh, mommy loves daddy because he's a sailor, right? Maybe the baby will think, why does mom love daddy more than me? Maybe she's kissing him, she's not kissing me. Maybe it's because he's a sailor like Popeye. Maybe he knows how to use boats and that's why mommy loves him. So then the baby thinks, I will be a sailor too. Then I will be loved. So in this case, sailing is a different source of satisfaction, which is not the baby. That is the phallus. The baby will reach for it, try to find become that phallus for someone else so that the baby can be the source of um, satisfaction. And maybe the baby will learn how to sail. So the name of the father, this is whenever the father interrupts the baby's imaginary fantasy. Um, that could be because, right? This is interrupting the baby's fantasy, right? The mom sees the father and the father gets attention. And so because the father exists, um, the baby's fantasy is being interrupted, right? Um, yeah, so the mom designates dad as an op her object of desire. Castration of the child, right? The child's imagination um, is not correct. The child realizes it's not perfect, it's not great. The child must situate itself um, within the law, the society, and the symbolic. So here's the petit objet A. 
is the object cause of desire. I'll explain this. Just remember object petit a is crooked glasses, seeing the object through my brokenness and my pain and my fears and my desires. The baby sees the world through fears and desires. Babe or believes sailing has power. If I sail, I will be loved, right? So without that trauma, it's just a sailboat. But with this trauma, the, the mom loves the dad because he's a sailor. Wow, there must be something about sailing, right? Even though sailing has no magic, right? Sailing is magical only in the baby's eyes. That's the petit object, seeing the sailboat through my brokenness. Petit object, object cause of desire. The baby grows up to become a sailor, right? Because he thinks if I'm a sailor, maybe someone will love me, right? Because sailing must be the reason why mom loved dad more than me. Oops, sorry. So the object, object cause of desire. We search for these phallic fragments, right? This is the source of satisfaction other than the baby. We try to find that in fast cars, in cell phones, in potential mates, that he, trying to get that source of becoming that source of love and uh, becoming that source of desire for someone that creates us to be, that causes us to be creative. It causes us to perfect our skills. It causes us to earn money and chase beauty. So we might remember this example from our um, classwork, the anorexics perspective, right? Someone who just is obsessed with being thin, wants to be very, very thin that they don't eat. That's a big um, eating disorder. She says, I want to be thin because thin from the object petit a, from this broken um, perspective, I want to be thin. Thin means in control, happy, like when I was seven years old, pure and powerful, like that child, not with these fat blobs. So the baby might see the fat, or not baby, but now it's growing up, maybe a teenager might see the fat and say, oh man, this fat is disgusting. I'm no longer happy. I'm no longer in control. I'm no longer pure like I was when I was seven. And so it's seeing the seven-year-old self as like pure and happy. And it's seeing itself now as fat and ugly. So anyway, that's the petit object from our um, lens. So here's the object cause of desire. So right, whenever we see it straight forward, if you look at this painting straight forward, this is just a blob. There's not much significance to it. We don't really know what it is. But if you see it slanted, if you see it like this from our broken perspective, from our hurts, our pains, our fears, our desires, it becomes something else. Maybe you've seen this before. If you look sideways at this painting, this skull will appear. And because we look sideways from our perspective, it takes on a new meaning. So the object petit a, object cause of desire, when viewed straight, right, not from uh, the subjective point, it's nothing important. It's just a blob. It's unclear. It has no meaning. It's just a blob. We don't really see what it is. So petit object a, object cause of desire, when slanted, when viewed slanted, it is no longer unclear. It takes shape in our slanted perspective, desires and fears, right? We have this kind of unusual glasses that we're wearing and that makes the, just the blob turn into something that makes us afraid and maybe makes us want it, right? The object petit a is the object viewed from the subject's slanted perspective. The I, the self, attaches extra meaning to the object, right? So that's like I said before, it's this blob when viewed straight, it's just a blob, it's not nothing. But whenever we see it sideways, slanted from our perspective, from our hurts and pains, oh my gosh, it becomes something scary. So here we go, object petit a, object cause of desire, some small feature might make us believe it is special or extraordinary. Like Zizek often talks about Marilyn Monroe's mole and that maybe it's that small thing that makes us say, wow, she's not a normal lady. She might be a very special and beautiful lady. Maybe
maybe because she has that mole, we feel like, whoa, it's a special lady. It makes us feel sublime. Sublime is just like awesome, just like, wow. It changes the, the thing into something awesome and sublime. The symbolic order. So now we're on to the symbolic order. We're going to talk about the big other. So anytime Zizek talks about the big other, he's talking about the symbolic order. It's basically the rules not from myself, which is the imaginary, but the rules from the other, which is society. So these are the things we'll talk about. Sundere, neurosis, obscene superego supplement, perversion. We'll talk again about the imaginary and the real and hysteria. So here we are at the symbolic order. The explanation of reality, it comes from society, not from the self like in the imaginary, but from society. This is the symbols, laws, religion, language. Examples, what is written in a history book. So I often think of a history book as the symbolic order because you know that was from society. That's what society says what happened. But of course, you know, a history book cannot be perfect right? A history book cannot say everything that happened. And a history book is also written from a perspective too. So it's important to remember that the, the history book is not perfect, right? You know what I mean? Like not everything in history is 100% perfect. There's probably like maybe 5% that they missed, maybe more. Um, doctors using their knowledge of medicine to treat patients. So this is also the symbolic order. This is based on human knowledge, human science, right? Human science has made a lot of progress, right? If we learn science, we can learn a lot of great things. But science doesn't know everything. Like right now, we're talking in um, 2020 during the COVID situation, right? Science doesn't know the vaccine yet of um, COVID-19. So even though it has a lot of knowledge, it doesn't have all knowledge. And that's something important to remember about the symbolic order is it's the human knowledge right now. So we're talking about the tsundere. This is a character type often in um, Japanese literature and anime. It, she pretends to be cold. She's embarrassed to show love. So maybe she'll say, you're stupid. Oh, I don't like you. you know, boo, boo, boo. No, thanks. She has an I'm better attitude. I'm better than you, right? You're not that cool. You know, even though she's, that's her love interest, she's kind of mean to her love interest. So that's the sundere. But eventually the sundere, even though they're kind of mean and they're like, I don't like you. Sometimes they'll slowly show like, oh yeah, I, I do love you. But, you know, it's kind of like this, you know, I love you from far away, things like that. Sundere and the neurotic boy. So this is from the, the sundere from the boy's perspective. And we're learning the first um, character type for um, Lacan Zizek is the neurotic. This is the neurotic. It's a boy, maybe usually, you know, uh, yeah, Lacan and Zizek often say that the neurotic is like a man and the hysteric is, some, is often a female, but it doesn't have to be like the way. The, the, a, boy, a man can be a hysteric and a woman can be neurotic but typically the neurotic is the man in um, Zizek and uh, Lacan. So um, the sundere, the, the um, neurotic boy in this relationship, the neurotic, he likes and dislikes the sundere. He doesn't want to leave. So there's a part of him that doesn't like being called stupid, right? He does not like being called stupid He's not really happy in the relationship with somebody being mean to you all the time. That's not very happy. But at the same time, he doesn't want to change. It's like, uh, you know, it's not that good of a situation, but I don't really want to change. Maybe for some fear or maybe he has some small joy that makes him stay. That's basically the, the neurotic is it's, he's in a bad situation, but he doesn't want it to change because he finds some small thing that he likes about the situation. So even though it's bad, it's like, I'm gonna keep staying. So um, the neurosis, this is some obscene joy. Um, you know, obscene is kind of not very good. It's something usually bad um, and it's usually shocking. So it's like, whoa, that's pretty bad, right? And so of course these things are very bad, um, Nazis and KKK, um, but 
some people accepted their leadership, right? Why some Nazis, or sorry, why Nazis and KKK people accept their, you know, not good leadership is because there's some small joy that they get from um, being a member of the KKK and the Nazis. The obscene pleasure is tolerated. Bullying isn't punished. Do um, you know what I mean? So maybe you were in school and there was a bully, but the bully was never punished. So the bully keeps bullying. Like the, the society sometimes tolerates bullying. And that's the obscene um, superego supplement, the obscene joy. Like the bully says, you know, maybe if I follow the rules a little bit, I can keep bullying. Yeah, that'll be fine. But obviously, I don't think that's a good thing. And you know, I hope, hope bullying will end. But that's part of the um, obscene superego supplement is that society tolerates some kind of bad behavior sometimes. The ideology of the symbolic order winks, like Zizek always talks about, there's like a wink that um, says, it's okay, do it. Um, because if you, you know, the, the ideology, like the, the Nazi ideology says like, you know, we're hardworking, we're good people, but you know, it might be hard to follow that just by itself. So the, the Nazi ideology tolerated evil and bad things, which made people um, follow them, you know? So anyway, Zizek, I'm going to show you a Zizek movie now to um, show how he explains it. You've actually seen that clip before, but I thought it would be good to show it here. The second thing that is important is that uh, traditionally, ideology worked in the opposite way. Uh, the official message was this pure ethical one, obey, sacrifice yourself, and then uh, you had to put glasses on to get the obscene under message. The, the examples that I always give, for example, in fascism, Nazism, the official message was enough of decadence, sacrifice yourself, work for the country. But then, in order to make this message functional, ideology bribed you with whatever. Uh, you can beat, you can steal, you can beat the Jews or whatever, or the dirty pleasures. Or in America, Ku Klux Klan. Officially, Christianity, we defend the white race. The truth of it was, what do you see when you put glasses on? Saturday evening, we gather, we rape some black girls, we lynch some blacks. So in traditional ideology, this uh, surplus enjoyment, the dirty obscene enjoyment, the way those in power bribe you to collaborate is hidden. Today, it's almost the opposite. I ideology directly addresses you with pleasures. Enjoy, do it. So we need glasses to see the real image. Okay, so a little bit more, just following up what Zizek said. So Nazi Germany's outside message, right? No more decadence, right? No more luxury. Sacrifice yourself for the country. Work hard. But even though it has this outside message, we can probably think back to ideology critique, right? Where the surface message seems kind of good, right? Oh, they're being, they must be good people. Sacrifice yourself, work hard. Wow, they must be good. But there's an under message. Um, under that message, it encourages people to do evil, to steal, to hurt and beat up people. So even the Nazis, maybe they showed a nice surface message on the back side, like the false consciousness, if we remember. There's a lot of bad things going on. So Zizek calls this tolerated evil as the obscene superego supplement. So that's what the neurosis is. He doesn't want to change the situation because he enjoys the evil that is permitted. He enjoys hurting and beating up people or stealing some kind of small joy. Um, and you know that could be the same, just like the Sundere. Maybe he gets some small pleasure from being in that relationship, so he doesn't want it to change. So let's think about what would a neur neurotic be like in therapy. So we talked about this example of the lady who always says too much, you're too much. Like the woman complains her family is too much because she must clean and host. The family invite, or the brothers invite over, the sons invite over their friends or girlfriend. And the mom feels like she has to um, clean. So she says, oh, this is too much. But what she actually, what the too much thing that she was saying, it was actually hiding her real feeling, which is 
she feels too little, she feels unappreciated. But saying that she feels too little is too painful. It's like too painful for her. And so what would she do in therapy if she was a neurotic? If this woman were, in, were a neurotic in therapy, if she was talking to a psychologist, she would just present her symptoms. She would say, I'm tired, I'm so tired. My family's too much, right? She would tell stories. My sons bring their friends over. They're always making me clean. She would avoid silence. She wouldn't want the, the she wouldn't want to find a solution. So she just keeps talking. She doesn't let the um, psychologist talk. She hides her real feelings because she can't say she feels too little. She doesn't want the solution to come out. She doesn't want the truth to come out. She wants to keep the situation as it is because maybe she gets some pleasure in that situation. Maybe she has some obscene superego supplement, which is allowing her to continue. And she doesn't want to give that up. That's the neurosis. So now the second type is as the pervert. Um, of course, pervert could be a man or woman. It's just a, like a character type. The pervert wants to be the boy's servant. So we're just imagining the girl is the pervert in this situation, but it could be the boy or the girl. So um, the sundere, she wants to be the boy's servant. I think of the pervert as the servant, something that is very connected. She believes, or she believes the boy wants her to say, you're stupid. So maybe she thinks, oh, I know. If I call him stupid, maybe he's gonna like me, right? So she says, you're stupid, you're stupid. And she's like, oh yeah, he's gonna love me if I call him stupid. So she's trying to please the boy by saying, you're stupid. The pervert wants to be the love object, wants to be like objectified, wants to be used, wants to be the instrument of the other, wants to be controlled. It kind of elevates the boyfriend as you know the, the lawgiver and the source of pleasure. So it's almost like uh, a worship. And like um, perverts are often very religious people, often sometimes like the extreme religious people who are like terrorists. Um, because they know that they are 100% correct. They think that their um, you know, religious text has no holes. They, they think that the symbolic has no, there's nothing, it's completely perfect. That's what they believe is a pervert. It's like the, the other, the symbolic other, the um, big other, the symbolic order is perfect. And so they can follow it completely. The symbolic other is the lawgiver and the source of pleasure for the pervert. And so the pervert, because they can completely trust the other, the boyfriend, um, they become unafraid of scary things. So like death or sex or violence. If you know like Romeo and Juliet, like the passionate lovers of the Shakespeare story, they um, kill themselves because they trust each other. They have like perfect trust in, the, in each other. So death is not scary for them. You know, sex or violence, you know, these things that could be scary, they're not, a, they're not afraid of them because the pervert becomes a servant and completely trusts the other. Um, so death, sex, and violence are in the symbolics perfect plan, right? So these things from the other are, you know, trustworthy. They can trust those, those scary things. That's what the pervert is like. So the pervert, for the pervert, there's only the symbolic. Like it's not really about imaginary, it's not about the real, which we'll talk about in a moment. If the symbolic has no holes, all history books are 100% correct. So the pervert would, would trust this history book 100%. The history book contains every fact, it's missing nothing, it's perfect. Or maybe the religious text for the religious pervert. There's no room for thinking outside the rules of society because the rules are perfect. There's no room for doubt, right? You don't need to doubt, you know, it's perfect. Why would you doubt this perfect thing? This perfect um, boyfriend or the, the perfect religion or imagining something else, right? There's no room for imagining something else, right? If there's only the symbolic, you just stand in line, you only follow, you just become a follower, which would be the pervert. But if we remember back to our, um, one of our videos about from the thought cooperation, the imagination, the imaginary, 
the symbolic actually should work together with the imagination, right? This is this will bring about good solutions, right? So the doctors treat symptoms based on symbolic and guessing, which is like the imaginary. So basically, whenever we're using both, this can create a lot of solutions to problems. Like if we're only looking at the knowledge and not really thinking about the patient, then um, you know what I mean? We're not going to have those good solutions because we didn't think about, um, you know, we, we weren't able to think creatively, which is where the, which is from the imaginary realm. So we're also talking about the real, which is outside of the um, symbolic. I think of the reals as like the holes in the symbolic, like the things that the history book could not contain because no history book is perfect, right? Every history book is going to miss something. Same with science, like science knows a lot. There's a lot that science knows, but there's some things that science doesn't know yet. For example, the COVID vaccine, we don't know it yet. Hopefully we'll get it soon though. And you know, there could be in 20 years, there could be another COVID situation um, that we don't have the vaccine for. So society needs to progress, science needs to progress. It's limited right now. And of course, I think it always will be. Um, there'll always be the holds in the symbolic because no history book is perfect. History is told from one perspective, right? But whenever history happened, there was many, many, many perspectives. Many people saw what happened. And so um, they say that history is written by the victor. History is written by the winner. So there's also the, the loser's perspective too, which might not have been contained, which might not be in the history book. So um, that thing that was not contained, maybe the loser's perspective, that's not in the history book. So the history book left out many perspectives and details. And we're just going to talk about that. So we can think about this girl as the winner. She won the war, so she gets to write what happened. Uh, maybe that boy, he lost the war, so his, his perspective is not concluded. We don't know what happened. He may have some important information that we don't know. So think about the symbolic as the Swiss cheese, right? It's the, it's the laws of society. But the real is what is not, is what is missing. It's those holes. So I think of the real as the holes in the Swiss cheese, right? So the real are the holes in the symbolic. Written history is the symbolic, right? It's, is different from what, I'm sorry. The written history is different from what actually happened and escaped, right? So you know what I mean? The history book, of course, it has a lot of good information, but what actually happened in history, right? There's things that we don't know. That's the real, right? The real history. Some things escaped the history books. And, you know, you can use the imaginary to think about what might have happened because history can't possibly have known every single thing to happen. And those things that it didn't contain, that's the real, the whole in the history book. So I think there's a couple of examples of the, of the real. I think of Rurouni Kinshin. He was an amazing swordsman who stops a revolution during the Meiji era. He fought his enemy, Makoto Shishio, if you ever watched that show, and he stopped a revolution from happening. But so the whole time he's just this awesome swordsman and we don't really know who he is. But after he saves Meiji Japan, um, we learned that he had a wife and we're like, oh, whoa, he had a wife? And so there was a whole nother part of his life that we didn't know, right? We were following him as he was um, fighting Makoto Shishio, but we didn't know he had a wife. And so there was, there was more things that was happening in his life that we didn't know, even though we were following the story the, of the anime or the manga. So because he had a wife, this detail opens a whole new aspect to his life and it makes us understand Kenshin in a new way. So after, if you follow um, Kenshin, so after he saved the Meiji Japan, um, we learned that he has a wife and then a whole new story began about his past and about his present. So um, that's just basically saying whenever we have holes, which is the real, whenever we have things that we don't know, um, that's just that 
those are things that we don't know and it could open up a whole new thing if we learn about them. So another example of the real is the Da Vinci Code. This was kind of popular when I was probably in middle school, I guess. But this is Tom Hanks, he's a famous actor. He was in the movie. Um, it's basically imagining, reimagining the recorded history or the recorded religious text. So um, yeah, so the Bible is, is a religious text, um, but it has no mention of Jesus's love life. Um, but so basically what Da Vinci Code is, and Da Vinci Code is just a work of fiction. It is not like a history book. So it's, it's just like imagining if this situation happened. So, um, right, so real history. What was Jesus's love life really like? That's what this um, book and movie ask. It's like, I wonder, maybe something was happening. Maybe like Roni Kinchin, he had a wife that we don't know about. And so the Da Vinci Code was a movie or a book that imagined unknown details about Jesus's life that were revealed. And he's in the book imagines that Da Vinci, Leonardo Da Vinci, knew the secrets. So the Da Vinci Code book movie imagines Jesus had a wife and a family, and the Catholic Church just hid these details. So those hidden details that we don't know are the real, right? So um, in that movie or the book, they look at these paintings of Da Vinci and they think, wow. Da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci, the painter who painted all these amazing Renaissance paintings, he knew something about Jesus's life that we don't know in the history books. He, who was this woman, right? He was sitting at this table with this woman. You know, who is that woman? Is that a woman sitting next to Jesus? So Leonardo da Vinci knew all along. Of course, this is just a fiction, and it, but it just reimagines the unknown parts of history. And that's what the real is. It's just the unknown parts of history. And of course, like, you know, based on this picture, we don't know if that was a man or a woman, but Da Vinci Code book was imagining oh, there was a woman. And of course it could have been a man. Some people think that it was the, um, what the, like one of, one of Jesus's disciples was um, John called the beloved. And they, in the, in the Bible, he's often like resting his head on Jesus. So it makes, you know, Whatever, I don't, we don't know if that's supposed to be a woman or a man in the painting, but, you know, based on the accounts, the religious accounts, that was supposed to be a man, but why does it look like a woman? You know, anyway, that's just an example of the real. There are some unknowns in history that we don't know 100% for a fact. A pervert would say that the, the history account is perfect or the, the religious account is perfect but that would be the pervert perspective. It doesn't leave room for doubt. Maybe it is a woman. We don't know, right? That's just to say like doubt is what, um, you know what I mean? Doubt is like that real, the whole and the symbolic. Sundere, the hysteric. So this is the last type of these um, neurotic, which is like the, the scared boy, um, but he wants to stay in the relationship because of some small joy. The pervert who um, believes the other is completely perfect and the hysteric um, is like this. The hysteric is kind of like realizes that the symbolic is not perfect. The, the hysteric like sees the Swiss cheese and sees the whole and so it pushes back really hard. It's like, no, 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 you're, you're not enough. You're not enough. Push, 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 push. It, it kind of you can think of the hysteric as inside of the real and pushing back on the symbolic, right? She just toys with the other. She pushes the limit. So she says, um, if I call him stupid, will he still love me? But what the hysteric is doing is she's trying to get something from the other. She's trying to get something from the boy and trying to say like, hey, you're stupid, you're stupid. You know, you, I'm trying, she's trying to be in control and push back. So this hysteric, she wants to be loved. She wants to be chased. She wants the symbolic or the, the other to come after her. She wants to be desired, but she also wants to be free. She does not want to be controlled. She does not want to be a servant. That would be horrible for a hysteric. The hysteric does not want to be the love object or controlled. 
She wants to be, like I said, loved, chased, desired, and free. So she provokes the other's desire. She's like, aren't I beautiful? Don't you like me? But once, once the other starts to say, oh, I do like you, she says, oh, sorry. <laughs> and um, that's probably whenever she says, like, um, you're stupid or, or I'm better than you. Um, she, she wants to disappoint the, the other, the boy, the symbolic order. She wants to disappoint it so she can be free. And then she can, you know, let him chase again. That's what the hysteric does. But this is just hysterical acting out, which means behaving badly. Right? The hysterics want to get something from the other, so they act out, they behave badly, and they complain. They try to get the other to solve her problems. Right? She tries to get the other, I want you to help me. I want you to um, carry my books. I want you to give me money. You know, I want you to do these things symbolic order. Um, and that's why she's acting out. She's trying to get more and more. But this hysteric is different from the act, which is the revolution. The revolution is what completely changes the situation. Um, the act shows the limitations of the symbolic order. So in some ways, the hysteric does that, right? It says like, oh, symbolic order, you're not enough. You're, you're not giving me enough. You could give me more. But the act forces the symbolic order to change. So the act is like a revolution and it will completely change the symbolic order. It's going to do something that will just, boom, you know, things will be different because of the act. The act rejects the obscene superego supplement. And we're going to see that example with Martin Luther King. They basically say, no, that is not, that is a contradiction. This, this symbolic order, you can't say on the surface that you're a hard worker and then in the back, you just kill people and steal people, steal from people. You can't have both. And so what the, what the act does is it presses hard on the stated tatemai and says, you said this, why aren't you doing this? And then hopefully the symbolic order will say, you're right, you're right, you're right. And then the superego supplement will break. That's what the act does. It will force the symbolic order to break. So with the act, what appears crazy at first under the normal um, rules of the symbolic order, at first appears crazy, but once it happens, it changes the idea of crazy. So what was once crazy is no longer crazy. That's the act. So here's some examples of the act. We talked about this in class. Steph Curry, he's an amazing, unbelievable shooter. Like I don't, many people say he's the best shooter who probably ever lived. Um, he is not tall. He is unbelievably good at shooting from far away shots. Like um, there's a video of him. He, he shot 100 three pointers and he made 96, which is a really far away shot. And he made 77 in a row. So he didn't miss for 77 shots. And if you watch him play, it's just unbelievable. So he never misses, you know, of course he misses sometimes, but he, he shoots these impossible shots and he just makes them like unbelievable. And so his team was just winning, 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 always winning. And because nobody could beat him, now all the basketball players need to focus on shooting the faraway shots. Like before Steph Curry, Nobody tried to shoot from far away. People almost never took that shot. But because, he, because through him, he showed that, you know, I can make these shots. And if you can't make them, you're going to lose. So now the basket, other basketball players need to shoot from far away. He basically changed the rules of basketball. Like, um, you know, everybody now has to shoot the far away shots or else they're going to lose. So um, we talked about this in class two, Trump debate. So um, in the 2016, and probably you could also say the 2020 um, debates, when he's debating the other people, the other candidates who want to be president, he's, he, he even says like, he's not very prepared. He's like, come on, I don't need to prepare. And so he's not very prepared. 
he attacks the other opponents, which is a logical fallacy, like using ad hominems. He basically says, oh, you're so stupid. You are so weak. You are so dumb. Like he says these things, but those are actually logical fallacies. And in a normal debate, you would either be disqualified or you would get a way less points um, in, a, in a real debate if you, if you did what Trump did. You'd probably be disqualified. You would, you know, you would lose. But uh, on the presidential debate, these attacks actually worked because the voters, they thought he seemed strong and confident. So when he said, you're so weak, you're so stupid, a lot of people thought, whoa, he's pretty strong. Maybe he might be pretty good. And so he won. And so he won by ignoring the rules. He won by being too, by being like kind of mean. And so basically he showed that like, you don't, in the presidential debate, those etiquette, like begi, like sonani, ano, shitagawa na te daijobu desu, kanji. Like you don't really need to follow the rules of etiquette in the um, political debates. And so from now, basically the presidential debates are going to be a lot different because basically this was a revolution. It's changed the rules of debate in the presidential election forever. Now political debates will be different in the future. Maybe people won't follow the rules as much because Trump showed that you don't have to prepare. You can just attack your opponents and the voters might think that's cool. Of course, he's not, you know, I don't say that he's a complete idiot or anything. He does know, he does, he does know some things about um, society and things like this. And, you know, um, to win the presidential election, you know, you, you, um, it's a hard thing to do and he did it. But I'm just saying he did it in a very unusual way um, because he was not following the rules. And because he didn't follow the rules, that was the act. It was a revolution. A revolution. So another um, act is Antigone. This is one of Lacan's and Zizek's favorite examples of the act. This is a story and I'm about to show you the movie. Antigone buries her dead father. There, she, she buries her dead brother, even though it's against the law. So the king Creon said, you cannot bury your brother because he was a bad guy. But Antigone said, no way, I am definitely gonna bury him. And so even though it was against the law and even though she was sentenced to death for doing it, she was not afraid. And she says, I'm gonna bury him. That's, a, that's un, inhumane, that's bad. That's so bad you won't even bury someone. So I'm gonna bury him myself. And so she basically showed how the law was kind of bad. She was, because of her action, she showed that this law that says you can't bury someone, she was basically saying this law is not good. So right, her actions helped people recognize what good behavior is. She showed what good behavior is, even though she broke the law. She basically showed that the law was bad and that what she is doing is good behavior. And the society agreed with her. The people said, wow, Antigone is right and the law is wrong. So she imagined what is the good, what is the good thing to do outside of the law's limits. And that's totally the act, right? She forced a change in the symbolic order. And I will show you that video now. Sophocles wrote the ancient play Antigone in 441 BC. The play begins with Antigone speaking with her sister, Ismene. Antigone wants help from Ismene to bury their brother, Polynesus. Antigone repeats Creon's decree that anyone who attempts to bury Polynesus will be stoned. Creon is the new king, so his threats are real. But Antigone can't sit idly by while her brother is food for the vultures. She feels compelled to bury him. Yet, there's no way Ismini is going to help her. The thought of being stoned to death petrifies Ismini. Ismini reminds Antigone that they have already lost so much of their family due to the curse of Oedipus. Ismini doesn't want to lose Antigone as well. Unfortunately, Antigone makes it clear that she is not going to budge. Antigone is determined to bury Polynesus. When Ismini realizes she can't change Antigone's mind, she at least asks Antigone to keep her plan secret. The guard comes walking back into the throne room to speak with King Creon. This time, the guard is hauling Antigone, Creon's niece. 
The guard claims that he arrested Antigone while she was burying Polynesis. The guard explains that when he returned to his post, he swept the dirt off of Polynesis. That's when Antigone came back to bury Polynesis again and got caught in the act. The guard is relieved, which contrasts the obvious pressure Creon must feel at his new predicament. Antigone immediately admits to the crime. She calls herself guilty and doesn't try to deny it. She continues with an attack on Creon for his immoral decree. She states that she would have rather died than have left Polynesis unburied. Creon remarks that even the stubborn Antigone will be made to follow the law, even if it takes violence. Antigone continues to argue with Creon. Her logic is that Polynesis deserved a burial as much as Edicles. She says that Polynesis' actions in life should have no bearing on how his remains are treated. Meanwhile, Creon argues that by honoring Polynesis, Antigone dishonors Edicles. Antigone is a dead woman walking. Creon has no intention of sparing Antigone, despite them being family. Additionally, Antigone makes no attempts to try and save herself. Creon imprisons the two women while he finalizes his decision. Haman, Creon's son, and Antigone's fiancé at first agrees to defer to Creon's decision. Yet, Haman does make a case for Antigone. Haman states that there is a growing sentiment amongst the population that Antigone does not deserve to die. Her convictions to bury her brother were noble. The chorus weighs in and advises Creon to heed Haman's warning. Unfortunately, the discussion devolves into a shouting match after Creon questions Haman's character. Creon reasons that Haman is a fool to defend a traitor. Haman asks what will be the fate of Antigone, and Creon explains her punishment. Antigone is to be sealed in a cave and starved to death. Unfortunately, a messenger comes in and informs the chorus that Antigone and Haman are both dead. Haman, frustrated at Creon's decision, took his own life. Eurydice, the queen of Thebes, comes in when she overhears the messenger. She's stunned and asks the messenger to repeat his message. The messenger says that Haman found his love, Antigone, strangled by a rope. Haman got extremely upset. He tried to kill his father, but then turned his sword on himself. When Creon returns to the palace, we learn that Eurydice has also killed herself. The messenger tells Creon that before Eurydice committed suicide, she cursed Creon for having taken away her only son. Creon can't believe what has happened. He admits that he is responsible for the death of his son and his wife. Creon is so shocked by the events that have transpired that he's not even able to walk away. Instead, he has to command his guards to come and carry him away. The End There's also, I um, hope you enjoyed the Antigone video, there's also The Act, which is by Martin Luther King Jr. He's, he was a Nobel Prize winner. He made a lot of great changes for American society. So basically, something he did, USA, from the beginning, said all men are created equal. This is in the American Constitution. And Martin Luther King said, really? All men are created equal? Are created equal? Do you really believe that? I mean... Why are so many Americans being treated so badly? So I think you probably know the tragedies in America. Even today, um, you know, unfortunately, African Americans are being killed for no reason. Um, they're being murdered just because they're kind of vulnerable and they are profiled by police. Um, that's kind of a fact. It's been on TV many times. And um, so unfortunately, these things are still happening. But because Martin Luther King said, really, you guys say, you guys believe that all men are created equal, but you are not acting that way. People are being killed for no reason. And so the U.S. says, you're right, let's change our laws. So basically, Martin Luther King pressed on that super up, or obscene super ego supplement and said, you know, if you're going to say you're equal and you're going to let people be like the KKK and kill people for no reason, 
you cannot say that. You know, your, your stated tatemai in your ura, your, your back, what's happening behind, you can't do that. And so basically, because he, he pointed to this, he pressed on the law, he pressed on the stated law, the stated tatemai. He said, you can't, you have to follow this. That forced US to change their laws. So because of Martin Luther, he got a Nobel prize and America changed a lot for the better. There's a lot better laws. They stopped the discrimination laws like the Sabitstikina Horitsuga, Dekiruma, Kawata, Moshiro, Mochiro, Nano, Imam Nimo, Kampiki Janai Kiro, Soreba, Akiraka des. Of course, even now it's not perfect, but that's obvious. So here's the master signifier. This is kind of like after the act happens. And it's even before the act happens. It's basically saying the symbolic order is from one person's perspective, or from like a perspective. It's not a perfect, um, it's not perfect. It's not, it's not like the pervert thinks it is. So the master signifier, it's seeing from a certain perspective. It, it, and also the master signifier, it makes the floating signifiers become still. So for example, this is Naomi Watanabe. She's standing next to some models, like some beautiful ladies. And, you know, I think a beautiful lady has, is basically a floating signifier because it could be a tsundere, right? It could be these beautiful ladies, maybe they could be the kind of lady who will say, you're stupid, you're not good enough. And, you know, I'm going to hurt you kind of thing. And maybe I might show a little bit of love, but I'll keep pushing you back. You know, that's, there's that tsundere stereotype. And so whenever we see these beautiful women, we don't know, are they tsundere? Are they tsundora? Are they, um, you know, some kind of, or are they maybe a nice lady? They could be nice, we don't know. They're, they're beautiful ladies who are nice, right? Um, so the master signifier, it will help us understand what these ladies are like. Are they nice? Are they mean? What are they? And Naomi Watanabe in this situation is orienting us and giving us direction because she is here. She's telling us what kind of ladies these are. And also the master signifier, which is Naomi Watanabe in this, it hides other perspectives and it hides unspoken parts. So because Watanabe Naomi is here, we don't really think that they're tsundere. We think that they're good ladies. So Watanabe Naomi is a very kind person. She supports victims. She's a symbol of self-acceptance and um, supporting people in society. Um, and so because she's standing next to these beautiful girls who could be you know, anything, we don't know, they, these beautiful girls must also be kind. Um, so because we're seeing from the Watanabe Naomi perspective, these floating signifiers become stable. So what if we change the master signifier to Yoshida Yo? Like Yoshida Yo is often playing like um, lovers or kind of people having affairs or like Uwaki. Um, she's famous because she had an affair. Um, like if you watch Kyoku ni Gozaimasen by um, Mitani Koki, it's a famous director, Japanese director. She was also playing the lover of the politician. Um, so, you know, she's, um, that's kind of has that reputation and she plays those kinds of characters. Um, so she has this reputation, like her name is Yo, which means sheep, but people often say she's actually a wolf, kind of like a predator. And so she, this predator, you know, sorry, that's kind of a strong word, but this uh, kind of wolf lady, scary lady, with these um, you know, beautiful ladies sitting next to her, you could think, wow, maybe these ladies are also wolves, right? Maybe this is the wolf team because we have such a strong impression of her. She, um, she is the kind of you know, predator. She's like stealing the husband or the boyfriend, things like that. Maybe these ladies are stealing husbands too, if they're standing next to Yoshida Yo. So master signifier, how can the meaning of this picture change without changing the content? Is there any way we could see this picture and have a different meaning, like the meaning where Watanabe Naomi and these girls are nice. Of course, if we have new information from the real, 
right? If the things that we don't know become known, we'll have new information. Maybe one of these girls was a bank robber. Maybe they stole some money. Then we'll think, ooh, wow, there's Naomi Watanabe and a bank robber? What? We're gonna be surprised. Or maybe something else. Maybe we realize Watanabe Naomi is actually a bad person or something like that. So here's some more examples of the master signifier. We learned about the story about the unlucky or the lucky girl. 11 year old girl who always says, I'm lucky, I'm lucky. She says it for unusual reasons, right? She doesn't get to go to the hairdresser. She says, I don't have to go to the hairdresser because I'm lucky. And she says, I don't have to go to a private school. Actually, her family didn't have enough money, right? Her family didn't have enough money to send her to the private school. So what did she say? She spun the story. She says, ha, I'm so lucky. I don't have to take the entrance exam. And also she does not get the rare bracelet. There was only like two pink bracelets, but like 20 purple bracelets, but she got the purple bracelet and she says, ha, ha, I'm so lucky. I got the purple one. There was 20 purple ones, but only two pink ones, but I got the purple one. So um, lucky supports her ego. It makes her think like, I'm a good person. It makes her think like, I am, I'm good, right? I'm cool. So by saying she's lucky, it helps her ego, her self image. It hides the painful truth, right? The painful truth is she was, you know, pretty unlucky. Some bad things happened to her. So she's trying to hide that. And she's lucky reinterprets the bad as something better. So she's seeing the world. The master signifier, remember, is a perspective. So she's trying to see the world through the lucky perspective that she's lucky. The lucky girl's perspective includes wanting to beat her brother, right? So she always was in competition with her brother. She's always trying to win. She never wanted to lose or be number two. She wanted to be the best at everything because maybe she thought if she was the best, then her parents would love her or she would be loved, right? She wouldn't have to, she would win against her brother. So if she couldn't be the be the best at something, her cheerful attitude would turn into rage. She could not accept being second. And so maybe she, she's normally happy. You know, I'm happy, I'm lucky, I'm lucky. But then if she can't be the best, she's like, no, kind of like a Gretzko or something like that. She wouldn't care about it anymore, right? If she couldn't be the best at something, she's like, oh, that doesn't matter. Who cares? I'm gonna do what I'm good at. Right? I'm good at math, so I'm going to win at this math test. <laughs> she finds something else to win at. So that's what the unlucky girl would do. We also learned about this story about um, rationality. Um, there was a lady who became a mathematician, like a scientist, because she loved um, certainty. She loved to be know that things are, you know, we can know the answer but she suffered because her mom was irrational. So this um, rational lady, she builds a personality opposite of her mom. She says, I don't wanna be like my mom. I don't wanna be irrational and ruin my life. I wanna be rational. I wanna know the answers. I wanna you know, follow math. She finds pleasure in thinking. She's like, ah, yes, I'm thinking. I'm so smart, wonderful, wonderful. I'm thinking clearly. I'm not like my mom, I'm so smart. So rationality became the master signifier. She started seeing the world through the rationality glasses. She chooses a career as a mathematician. She becomes a professional math person. She wants, to, she wants achievable solutions and she wants rationality. And if she could not find the solution, she couldn't sleep because she would obsess about it because for her thinking is the answer, right? But if she can't, if, and thinking becomes, if she can't solve it by thinking, she'll just think, 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 can't sleep, can't sleep. So that is um, basically the last one. Um, if you have questions about what books I used, I, I think I mentioned them um, in our, what do you call it? But I will send those to you if you want to know. Thank you so much. Good job, everybody.